Some of you think you know Brett. But did you think that he just wrote that song? Thank you, Brett. Thank you. It's the week after Easter. The world has finished celebrating, but we're not finished. But today's text talks about what happened next. And it reveals something that we really, really need to take note of. And that is, Jesus' death stunned his disciples because they were not focusing on him. So I've entitled our time together, Refocused Jesus. Because the story that Brett has just read for us is a moment in which Jesus comes along two of his disciples who had just witnessed everything in Jerusalem and incredul- they, they were incredulous. They, they, they couldn't understand why this guy who sidles up with them and is walking along with them hasn't heard what has gone on in Jerusalem that weekend. You must be, the Bible says, they say, Cleopas maybe is the one who says, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard. Heard what? Isn't it amazing how, how Jesus can just draw people out? Heard what? What? That Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. <laughs> They're incredulous. They're incredulous that this individual would not know, would not know about what had gone on. And so they continue along the road and Jesus is able to discuss with them. The first thing that I want us to concentrate on in this story, though, as they're walking along, is what one of them says to Jesus. He says, this guy Jesus was a really great prophet. Now raise your hand if you know uh, what the Muslims call Jesus. Anyone? Well, what, what, what kind of person do they say that he was? He's a prophet. What is the only reason that they believe Muhammad is more important than Jesus? Because he came later. Otherwise, most God-fearing Muslims believe that Jesus was a major prophet, just like this person who's walking down the road to Emmaus. He says, he was a great prophet. So point number one that this story brings to me is, uh, are we sure that we know who Jesus is? Or do we have uh, our own, maybe our own personal cherished belief about Jesus and about God that really isn't in line with what the scriptures say? And that, that may be a shocking thing for the pastor to say to you on this morning when you say, yeah, well, pastor, I'm sitting here in church in a Seventh-day Adventist church on the Sabbath. I think I know who God is. I think I know who Jesus is. And I'm saying, really? Because, you see, these people thought he was a great man. He was a great prophet. And, 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 and you know, they killed him. It's a tragedy. And what was, what was actually coming out of their mouths was the fact that they thought their idea of this guy and, and, and what he was going to do for them was now over, and that was what the great tragedy was. I guess what I'm trying to say is that, that they had a Jesus concept that involved 
the Messiah or this great person coming and freeing them from the Romans and making Israel great again. You notice Jesus' response, if you have your Bibles open or you have your phone open on your, your Bible app, okay, to uh, Luke 24, you notice that the way that Jesus responds is to ask a question. And I'm so glad he does. This is true rabbinic form, teacher form. He's asking his students, he's asking his people, because he knows these people, they just don't know him right now. So he asks them a question. Don't you remember what the prophets said would have to happen to the Messiah? Jesus does not call himself a prophet. He calls himself the Messiah. Don't you know what the prophets said about the Messiah? He didn't say what the prophets said about another prophet. So right away, even in his question, Jesus is saying, you know what, your concept of what just happened and who you thought that person was on that cross, he's not just a good man, he's not just a prophet, he is the Messiah. And he does this by just adding in that word in his question. I think it's so kind, I think it's so compassionate but yet it's already leading the discussion where he wants it to go, and where he wants it to go is to show them, beginning, the Bible says, beginning, Luke says, from Abraham, excuse me, from Moses' books, which were Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the five books of Moses, the one whole section of the Hebrew Bible, there are three sections. One is the books of Moses, the other is the wisdom literature, and then there are the prophets. Jesus takes two of those sections, the books of Moses and then also the prophets. Maybe he even threw in some wisdom literature from David or Solomon. And he shows them what was supposed to happen to the Messiah. Don't you remember, he says, what was supposed to happen to them. I say, Jesus came into this world to change people's spiritual understanding of God. But they were more interested in what he could do for them physically. And in this case, what he could do for them as far as freeing them up from the Romans. This had clouded their minds, and as, they, as the Bible says that they could not see him, they could not understand who it was that was walking with them, this is also metaphoric. It is also a way of saying what we need to say, and that is, do we truly have our focus in focus when we look at Jesus? Did they? The answer is no. They had a different idea. They had a different concept of God that was in focus. And as a result, as he is walking with them, they still do not recognize him for who he really is. We say that we are people of the book. You know, we, we, we like to say that uh, the Bible is very important to Seventh-day Adventists. And it is. I was uh, at a meeting this week, and at that meeting was the American Bible Society. And don't you know, the representative of the American Bible Society congratulated our church for being one of the biggest supporters of the American Bible Society and their distribution of the Bible throughout this land. That's a pretty, pretty high accolade. Because we believe in the Bible. We would like to get the Bible into people's hands. We would like to get the the, the sayings and the message of the Bible into people's hands. We are people of the book. But like our forebears, maybe we read that book looking for what's in it for us. Looking for, for direction maybe for us. What if today we could say in 2019, for for this entire next year until maybe Easter comes again, we're going to read the Bible and we're going to be looking for Jesus. 
We're going to be looking for Jesus instead of ourselves. Jesus reminds his traveling friends, didn't the prophets say that the Messiah would suffer? Have you read the book? You say you're people of the book, I say I'm people of the book, but if we don't read the book and know what the book says about Jesus, it does us no good, and in fact, it leaves us vulnerable to go off in our own direction. Jesus has a name that's given to him even before he comes into the world. We know him at Christmas time as Emmanuel, which means God with us. God came and embedded himself in our culture. He enfleshed himself in our likeness. And he then goes on traveling with these two disciples and ends up at their table. Now, some commentators would like us to, to focus on this in a very big way because this is, a, this is a crunch moment in the story and it is also something that tells us so much about Jesus' ministry. First of all, he's going past and he's making as if he's going to, to go on by. We would think this was you know, normal, and it was, but it was part of a social game that was being played. He was a friend, and so he is unknown to them. He's a bit of a stranger, but they have been talking now, and they, uh, they, they are very, very interested in what he has to say, but hospitality dictates that they should invite him in, regardless of whether they have space, regardless of whether they have food. And so they do this. They, they say, why don't you stay with us for the night? It's, it's, you know, it's, it's getting dark. Jesus says, oh, no, no, I must continue. And they press him, the Bible says, they press him because they really, really want. It's kind of as if you or I were to say to somebody, hey, how are you doing? And they say, fine. And that's really all we want to hear. But if we say again to them, no, I, I really want to know, how, how are you doing? Suddenly it gets very serious. Suddenly they know that our intent is to have them tell us how they're really doing. So it is with this custom. They pressed him again and he came and he sat at their table. He accepted their invitation of hospitality. He does something next, which is against the social customs. He sits at the head of the table. This would rightfully have been the place where the man of the house would have sat when they were about to start the meal. But Jesus takes this place and in some respects turns these individuals into guests in his house. Are you guests in the Lord's house today? Interesting how that is. You've come wanting to meet with him, and instead he says, come to the table, I'll be there ready to break the bread of life. So he does, he, he picks up the bread, and this is where the second point is that I want you to, to, to think about. How was it that their eyes were opened? How was it that they came to understand that this was not just a prophet, this was not just a good man with a very good memory about all those Bible passages? No, this, this was the Messiah. How did they figure that out? Well, this one commentator uh, does it this way, so I'm going to do, do it so that you can see. He breaks the bread and he passes it out. So what would be visible to them for the first time now? They saw his hands. And they knew in an instant who he was. In the wounds, in the wounds that Jesus had on our behalf, he is identified. And Ellen G. White says that he will always be identified by those wounds. 
Are we, are we not amazed that the God of creation who has incarnated himself into humanity has decided that out of all creation, and we don't even have an inkling how vast that is, out of all creation, he is willing to identify with this, with this human family forever and ever. The scars in his hands and his feet, the wounds that he took on our behalf, as our Messiah that was predicted by Isaiah and all the prophets, which these two travelers had forgotten because they had their own agenda for Jesus. He breaks bread with them. He shows them his scars and the Bible says their eyes were opened. I believe that when we immerse ourselves in the story, uh, uh, that, that we see the wounds of Christ and that we hear his words of encouragement. I've said at least to, to, to one person this morning already, I, I believe that that's the best reason to come to church. That's the best reason to gather ourselves other than worshiping God. We, we become literally his hands and his feet to others around us. And as we show the fact that we too have been wounded by this world and that God has healed us, that we become a, a, a living testimony to each other that encourages and, and helps us then to, to be able to keep going. And hopefully that our neighbors will also see that and that they will be able to keep going. Well, I believe that there is a change that God needs to make in us. Not just to live in His presence in the earth made new, but to live in this valley of the shadow of death as citizens of His present kingdom, wounded and all. If I have anything that I would want to impart to you today and every day, it is the encouragement to let Jesus, the real Jesus, the real Messiah, show you his scars and for you to say, thank you, Jesus. I understand now who you are and I'm ready to live with you and for you in the here and now, not just so that I'll get a crown someday, not just so that I will have this heaven that you speak of, Jesus. No, no, I want to be with you now. I want to be in your kingdom now. I would love your Holy Spirit to be infusing and, and leading my life now. That would be my greatest desire for myself and for each of you. William Blake is accredited with the following saying with which I will leave you. It's in the writing that he did called The Fourfold Vision. Unless the eye catch fire, the God will not be seen. Unless the ear catch fire, the God will not be heard. Unless the tongue catch fire, the God will not be named. Unless the heart catch fire, the God will not be loved. Unless the mind catch fire, the God will not be known. Sometimes it's good to sit back and ask ourselves why we do what we do and where it's taking us. Because it is taking us on a journey. And I know that my journey, I hope, by God's grace and His power, 
will be to wend my way through this first part of my eternal life and that big change happens and that it will continue on in the very visual presence of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the wish of all of us. So that's what happened, you see, because the disciples, they realized who he was, and that's when their eyes were opened, and that's when he disappeared. And when he disappeared for good, he did say, remember, that I will send you another comforter. So it was a very comforting thing to be in his presence, but then he disappeared. And, and I don't know, anybody seen Jesus this week? I guess he still disappeared. I guess he's still not visible. I guess he's still asking us to be that representation of himself in our world today. And, and, and also, he's asking us to look forward to the time when we will see him again face to face, which for these disciples was just a few hours later. It's a very short time. Don't think that God is delaying his coming, my friends. He is on his way, and it is going to be a short time when you count it against eternity. It's a short time. <laughs> These guys, they hardly, they probably bolted their food down, wrapped their, their uh, cloaks around them, and took off in the dark. Now, back the same way that they had come to Jerusalem because they had news that couldn't wait until morning. They had to get back to the disciples. It is true. He is, one, the Messiah, and two, he is risen. Now, we celebrated that this last weekend, and we have this message now that we can give in our doings and in our lives. He is risen, and because he is risen, he is the king of the world again. He always was, but now we know for sure. And we can live with him physically and spiritually forever and ever and ever, beginning right now. They get back, they tell them that they have seen the Lord and that he is indeed risen from the grave and that he said he would and that he did it was so amazing to them. And then suddenly the Bible says, there he is in their midst, in the flesh. And don't you know, he was hungry. Now, he hadn't had anything to eat, I guess, uh, not that it would matter, but he wanted to show them that he was not a ghost. He even says so. I'm not a ghost. You got anything to eat? Yeah, we, we had fish. Oh, sure, I'll have some fish. I like how you cook it. And he has some fish with them to show them that he is real. My friends... I don't know what Jesus is going to need to do for you, but he's done some amazing things for me to show me that he is real today. And that this week, this week as we go forward, we can know that he is real and that, that we can share him and tell people he's not a dead Jesus. He's a risen Lord. He is a risen Savior. He is in the world today, the song says. And I know this because he's in my life, because my heart like these disciples, has burned within me. So I don't know if you can tell that about me. I hope you can, that these are the things that I love to talk about. And you say, oh, well, that's because you're a pastor. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you, when, that, when your mind catches fire, then you can talk about this. When your heart catches fire, then you can, when you have heard from Jesus that he loves you, that he died to save you, and that he's coming back real soon to get you, what are you going to do? You're going to walk all night through if you have to, just to tell that person the same glorious story. We're all on the road to Emmaus. Jesus wants to speak to us, and he wants to speak to us very clearly. And so uh, opportunities come around, and I'm going to use this opportunity right now to just let you know that we as an organization in the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, have, have organization. And so right here, right now, as we're thinking of going forward with our mission as a church, I want to flip us into a business meeting. And you're thinking, Pastor, that's not a call. Well, it is a call. Because there are several members of our church who have said yes to being delegates at the next 
session meeting, which is when we choose our conference leadership. And this is done in a diplomatic, in a, uh, a representative sort of way, just like the early church. We do this. So the following individuals have said yes to representing you. Birker, Inga, Norm, Jordan, Amanda, and Linda. Now some of you are saying, which Linda? Well, that's Linda Scotter, uh, Jordan Thornburg, Inga, and Birker. They go by different last names, don't they? She's Runov's daughter. We have some Icelandic people with us in our congregation, if you didn't know. And Norm Whitley. These individuals have said, yes, I need a vote from you that you would like them to represent you at this constituency meeting as the representatives from this local congregation where Jesus is being lifted up every Sabbath. Is there a motion to accept this? There's a motion. Is there a second? There's a second. All in favor, please raise your hands. Aye. Okay. Are there any opposed? Thank you. Also journeying along, we have, we have to say goodbye sometimes because people move away. Our friend, Mr. Bell, has decided to move to Arizona. He is our church treasurer. This is a very big job. As we move forward as a congregation, you are faithful with your tithes and offerings, and somebody else needs to take care of all of that. And so the church board has asked me to ask several people, and the person who said yes is standing at the back, and his name is Norm Whitley. I, on the behalf of the board, would like to ask you this morning if there would be a motion to accept this recommendation from the church board. There is a second. Is there a second? Yes. All in favor, please raise your hand. All right. Thank you very much. Your church board functions on your behalf to elect people like this in between uh, business sessions, in between nominating sessions as well. We are the personnel committee, as, uh, uh, if you like. But we do these things because organization is important and because we are part of an organization whether we like how it's organized or not. So I want to thank you for these, these thoughts, and I do think that they fit together with what we have just been talking about because, you see, Jesus came. He came and gave to his disciples a job to do we would like to do that job in a very organized fashion, and I think we do. So thank you for, for helping me with this. I have one last thing, and it has to do with a young lady who no longer is able to come to church with us. How many of you remember Terry Stanley? Terry, if you're watching, well, you may not be watching. Your eyes are not so good, but your hearing is. And if you are in my hearing, Terry, I'm reading this because you wanted me to. This is a letter from Terry Stanley, who has now moved to Texas. My messengers to my family and to my church family, you are blessed. There's a blessing from Terry Stanley today. And so, so am I, for I have seen you all in my prayers and my blessings to you. Peter, and as a brother, I love you as well. She's very She's very worried about our friend Peter, who, by the way, needs, needs your prayers. He is in a rehab center right now and is uh, continuing his physical therapy there. For you all, have been in, you all have been in the kingdom of God, for my faith as with you, is with you all. This is a, a young lady who suffers from many difficulties in life. And I want you to know she is praying for each one of you, and particularly praying for Peter. She says, For I dwell to the kingdom, all my church family, please I wish to see you all once more. Thank you, Terry. We love you too. 
No matter where you go in this life, my friends, you can know that you are part of this family. You, are, you can know that you, that you have people praying for you. You can know that, that as we walk the road to Emmaus or wherever it is that we are going, that we can walk with Jesus and that he reminds us of where he has come from and where he is going and where we can go to. This is my prayer for you today and always. Amen.